With, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we invite your presence once again as uh, we open up your word to be instructed by you um, about the things that are coming upon this earth. And uh, we lift up each other in prayer. Uh, people in this movement, we just ask, Lord, that um, you can help us with all of our particular problems and struggles that are being thrown at us. We know, Lord, that you have foreseen all these things and that they are for our good. Um, help us to understand the book of Ezekiel. May your Holy Spirit that inspired it uh, be our guide and teacher as we read these words together. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Somebody's mic is making noise. I'm not sure whose that is. <clears throat> is it mine? I don't. Maybe somebody turned it off. I don't know. Somebody's was making noise. It's not happening now. So it's probably not ours. Now, this section, of course, uh, as Dwight and I were talking about before we started recording, is uh, chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel are really one vision. The division between these two chapters doesn't really make sense, but it's it's there. So, uh, so we're studying one prophecy. Now, I've mentioned this before in talking about um, this section in Ezekiel 38, and we have looked at it, 38 and 39, um, in context with other things, that uh, this is a portion of Ezekiel that I studied way back in would have been like 88, 89, something like that, because Christadelphians use this and they have it as prophecies about Russia that's going to come and attack Israel. So, um, so I'd looked at it and I knew that that was incorrect, but in studying it out, I found lots of interesting things back there. Mostly though, just lots of questions, what this was about. It led me to the study of Genesis chapter 10, dealing with the different, of uh, the division of the nations. And we know, you know, it's interesting, Genesis chapter 10, uh, what is the number 10 symbolize? Judgment. One thing, but another thing it symbolizes is the number 10, 10 horns. What is that about? The United Nations, the world, right? So the number 10 is the symbol of, of the world itself. Um, you as far as, what's that? You want to pray? Do you want to pray first? I did pray. Okay. Yeah, I prayed. Oh. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know I do that sometimes too, you know, especially when we're, we're going to eat. Did we pray already? But... Um, so I'll start praying again, even though I'd already prayed. But anyway, um, so so when you look at the number 10, we know that that's the 10 horns. That's, that's the number of the nations of the world, right? So we've used the number 10 um, lots of times to represent the world. And so I always think it's interesting that Genesis 10 is the dividing of the nations. Uh, so just, you know, it's just kind of a note there where that symbol comes from. And, and so when it comes to the division of the chapters, you know, this is something that happened much later. And, and sometimes people say, well, how can you use the chapters, you know, like Genesis 10 or, um, you know, where we were using uh, yesterday, we used 2 Kings 25, 25 verse 2 is exactly the same verse um, as Jeremiah 52 or, or fifth, no, it's Jeremiah 25 to is 52 verse five, right? Yeah, that's right. So Jeremiah 52 verse five, they're identical verses in the Hebrew, they're word for, you know, letter for letter the same. 
um, dealing with the 11th year of Zedekiah the, about the siege, right? And of course, this, this relates to the 252 and the 525 of the 777. So, but the point is people say, well, how can you do that when these chapter divisions are something that happened, you know, a thousand years after Christ? You know, why are, why are you able to, to do that uh, with the Bible? And so one of the arguments we have is this shows that God has had his hand over his word all through this time. And that these chapter divisions and verses are something that God has ordained through his providences that he has controlled. And God has done this in so many different ways in uh, all of the history of the world as it has unfolded. We can see God's hand in it. And, and this shows that God rules over all. He sets up kings. He takes down kings. He guides uh, people's minds. Um, he guides his servants. But even those that are opposed to him, their actions are foreseen and in a way that we can't understand, foreordained of God. God has, has taken into account all of these things. And so when we look at a prophecy, uh, this prophecy here against Gog um, and, and Gog and Magog, which is... Um, in the stream of the prophecy of Ezekiel, we are placing this in connection with the nations at the end of the world who are opposed against God. And it seems to me that Ezekiel 38 and 39 are, are covering the period from uh, the second coming of Christ, uh, both dealing with these nations before that and also after the thousand years. And we'll see that when we look at Revelation. The problem that we have here in, is that we've taken Ezekiel chapter 37 and we've, we've made an application in this movement of Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones, which is dealing with the resurrection and, and specifically the resurrection of the righteous. And then the joining of the two sticks, which would again be... Um, uh, a message about the second coming. And now Ezekiel 38 and 39 that, that John the Revelator is applying to a period after the thousand years. And we're going to see that uh, these, these are dealing with what happens at the latter days, right? So this is not, there's no way that the prophecy of Gog um, and Magog can be applied in some kind of historical sense of something that happened to the Jews in the past. That is, this is a prophecy that is apocalyptic. It's, at, it's end time prophecy, uh, just like Revelation would be. And, and yet, with the other chapter 37, we've made an application to our history. And the question that we have to ask is, can we take the prophecy of Gog and Magog, which is in the stream of Ezekiel, pointing to future events dealing with the second coming and after the second coming, after the thousand years? And can we make it a pre, uh, an application to our time as well? So that's going to be sort of the, the challenge um, of addressing this. And that means we're also going to, when we go into chapter 40 with the rebuild, with the temple, can again, can we make an application to our time um, with this, this temple and the measuring of the people of God and, and, and so forth? Um, so I think it's part of the, the puzzle of Ezekiel is that Ezekiel exists on many different levels. And, and we can see that. We can see that we can take uh, some of these, these, this study of Ezekiel and we can make applications on, on a broader level dealing with the church. Uh, but we can also apply it internally within this movement. So, so there are things about Ezekiel that um, which I think is true of all apocalyptic literature, whether it's Daniel or Revelation, that you can see that there can be applications that are fractalized. Um, but especially with Ezekiel. And why would that be with Ezekiel? What is it about Ezekiel that we've talked about that makes it this way?
Because who is Ezekiel? We are. Yeah, we are Ezekiel, right? So Ezekiel is dealing with this, this final group of people, this movement that is a typical movement that is, uh, is also typified by other histories, but Ezekiel embodies that in a more clear way than any other book of the Bible. You know, you can't really say we're John the Revelator, or you can't really say we're Daniel in the same way, because Ezekiel, he is given as a sign, and he's tied through his chronology with Millerite history, and through that Millerite history, he's tied with this movement. And, and this is an extremely profound uh, insight that God has given us regarding Ezekiel. And he did it with us being unwitting of what he was doing. That is, he, he did this in steps and stages. And it's these steps and stages that occurred within this movement that were always connected to these major events within this movement that was giving us this insight. Um, and, and this was being opposed um, by many of those who left and opposed the movement itself um, in various ways. And, and the only one who seemed to really understand what was happening was Elder Jeff. He understood the significance to some degree of what was happening with the book of Ezekiel. And he knew that the book of Ezekiel Back in 2016, he says, more light is coming from Ezekiel. And, and Jeff has always had this interest in the book of Ezekiel, but was never able to, to crack it. He was never able to understand it. And so when he saw it being understood, he recognized it. So just like me, um, Jeff knew that there was these things about Ezekiel, that Ezekiel was very opaque when it came to what it, how to apply its passages. And, and you can see this when you look at the commentaries. Uh, there's a lot of disagreement in the commentaries over the book of Ezekiel. So, so I think we're going to see here um, uh, some really important points. Now, there is, uh, Angela put a comment. Now, WLF12, what, what's that? Word to the little flock. Okay, I was wondering if that's what it was. Word to the little flock regarding God. Um, so, uh, so this says, and I'm not sure, uh, Christ's progeny contrasted with Satan's final destruction of Gog and Magog. So this must be Angela's words. Um, so I'd have to probably read Word to the little flock, page 12. So we'll use this before we have, so I have to bring this up. Now we're to a little flock, would that be under pamphlets? Because it's not a book. That should be no it I just look yeah I just look look for the word gog and that's the only only place I found and found it in the okay. SOP. But I'm sure yeah written more about it i just okay. okay yeah so here it is word to a little flock um okay so here's what ellen white says we're going to get into this but i want to actually go back and read a little bit so here's what she says um, and so this definitely relates to um and this is a letter she wrote to brother eli curtis um and she said share? yeah and i need to um uh, yeah, I need to shift. Uh, I have to share this screen. Uh, I'm doing it so I actually share each uh, thing separately so I don't have to edit videos anymore when I accidentally look at something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so... Um, she says, okay, in the day dawn, volume one, number 10 and 11, you kindly invite me to address you a communication. I only, the only apology I have to offer is not writing before, not for not writing before is I have not had a clear duty to write till now. 
You will, I doubt, excuse me for addressing you so publicly at this time. I have been much interested in your writings in the Dawn and Extra, and fully agree with you on some points, but on others we widely differ. Your Extra is now on the stand before me, and I beg leave to you to leave to state to you and the scattered flock of God what I have seen in vision relative to these things which you have written. I fully agree with you that there are two will be two literal resurrections a thousand years apart. So this relates directly to what we looked at in Ezekiel um, chapter 37, dealing with the Valley of Dry Bones. So we said that this is the resurrection. And, and, and I said, I'm not sure whether that, where that resurrection is particularly, whether it's referring to the special resurrection of the righteous um, uh, before the thousand years, which, which I think it would be, um, uh, or the, I, th I think that's, or just the resurrection of the righteous before the thousand years, the, all of the righteous. So, um, because there is the special resurrection and then there's the, the, the resurrection, right? <clears throat> um, but there, there's another resurrection, of course, the resurrection of the wicked after the thousand years. And, and of course, Gog and Magog would relate to that resurrection, so that, that's sort of the argument that I put with Ezekiel is that it's in this stream of, of presentations. So you got the resurrection, whether it's the special or the, or the, the first resurrection, as it's called. Or, and, and then you have the joining of the two sticks, which to me is the second coming. And then you're going to have this other resurrection of Gog and Magog who are going to come against uh, the holy city, as we see in the book of Revelation. So she says, I also agree with you that the new heavens and the new earth will not appear till after the wicked dead are raised and destroyed at the end of the thousand years. I saw that Satan was loosed out of his prison at the end of the thousand years, just at the time the wicked dead were raised, and that Satan deceived them by making them believe that they could take the holy city from the saints. The wicked all marched up around the camp of the saints with Satan at their head. And when they were ready to make an effort to take the city, the Almighty breathed from his high throne on the city a breathing of a breath of devouring fire, which came down on them and burnt them up, root and branch. And I saw that as Christ is the vine and his children the branches, so Satan is the root, and his children are the branches. At the and at the final destruction of Gog and Magog, the whole wicked host will be burnt up root and branch and cease to exist then will appear the new heaven and the new earth then will the saints build houses and plant vineyards i saw that all the righteous dead were raised by the voice of the son of god at the first resurrection and all that were raised at the section second resurrection were burnt up and ceased to exist so so this obviously and, and i would say that she's referencing here revelation gog and magog you know probably more directly than Ezekiel, um, but you know, from what we can see here, this this agrees exactly with our position of uh, these two the, these two resurrections and how we're taking Ezekiel and interpreting it. So Ezekiel thirty eight verse one, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog and the land of Magog and the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. Now, uh, Magog is mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. So these are the nations descended from Noah. And it says the sons of Japheth, Gober, and Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. Right? So these are the sons of Japheth. Now, um, so we know that there's these three sons of Noah, uh, um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? And Japheth is the one that that is the largest. Um, there are more people who are descended from Japheth than from any of the others. Um, Ham would be uh, the descendants that would take up much of Africa and different places like that. And then Shem are the Semitic peoples, so which of course includes the Jews, uh, but also some other peoples as well. So. 
when you deal with these division of the nations, and we had looked at A.T. Jones and how he, he looks at it, and he could take Tubal and Mishik and show that these were the people that went into the area uh, around the Black Sea and, and then later on moved north and became Moscow. And the Tubal River is named after Tubal. So this is the argument that A.T. Jones makes. So some of these names have survived in, in, in a form, you know, it's changed a little bit, like Moscow, doesn't really sound like Mishik exactly, uh, but you could trace these peoples. And, and so that's in the book uh, by A.T. Jones called um, uh, The Great Empires of the Bible. And so he also has, there's also another smaller book of him. Uh, I think it's called The Peopling of the Nations or something like that. So he does have another book as well um, that is kind of just a section of that bigger book. And, and other people address this as well. So there's other writers who go through. Now, sometimes, um, yeah, Moscow, they call it different, right? So, so when you look at these, the point is that you can take names and, and you can get some false etymologies. That is, you can, when names are changing as they move through different languages, sometimes people have, have, have drawn false conclusions because of the similarity of uh, these different names. And so you can't just take similarity of sound. And an example of this would be uh, the Worldwide Church of God would say, uh, who believe in what they call British Israelism. Uh, they believe that the people of Britain are the covenant people, that that's where the 10 tribes ended up when they were uh, uh, scattered abroad. At least one of the places they ended up would have been Britain. And they take the word British as uh, the Hebrew uh, Beret, which means covenant, and Ish, which means man, so the covenant man, of course, we can actually trace the word British in, in its correct etymology, and there's no connection between British and the covenant man. So, so just because names have some similarities of sound isn't sufficient to say that, you know, it's, um, that's, that's the correct uh, lineage. So, so you see a lot of false things like that. So I'm saying that when it comes to this, though, we know that these are the nations that went to the north. And based upon the Bible, we know uh, we at least can trace some of these. Now, of course, we have here Magog, Tubal, and Mishik. So these, are, these three are going to be mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38. Now, um, we also have uh, the sons of Japh Japheth mentioned in 1 Chronicles 1, verse 5. And, um, and then Meshach had already been mentioned as well as Tubal in Ezekiel 27, 13, which is where we talked about it before, and also in Ezekiel 32, 26. And, um, and in this one, so let's go there, um, there is Meshach and Tubal and all her multitude. Her graves are round about him, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they caused their terror in the land of the living. So one of the things is, that we can do here is this is talking about the graves. And when they talk about the graves and these multitudes, they're going to mention Meshach and Tubal, right? So that definitely relates to Ezekiel 38, where, where we're, we're, we're looking at this as the resurrection of the, the wicked after the thousand years. Now, um, it's interesting here, they don't, uh, okay, they do here. So uh, that's here, rather Gog. So here's how they translate it. So this would be an alternate translation of this passage. So it says here, son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And the alternate translation is, Gog, prince of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, so they're just putting the prince there in brackets, uh, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. 
by Magog is most probably meant the Scythians and the Tartars. So this is their, their view of who this would be. So-called by Arabian and Syrian writers is especially the Turks who are originally natives of Tartary and by Rosh. So they take the word Rosh, the Russians, descendants of the ancient inhabitants of the river Arax or Rosh. Now, this was the point that the Christadelphians made is they would translate this as son of man set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog and, and Rosh, prince of Meshach and Tubal. So they would take Rosh because that's the word in Hebrew is Rosh and Rosh just means head, right? So like Rosh <coughs> Shana, the head of the year or um, um, there's other examples uh, like in the first word of the Bible is Bereshit, and that just means in the beginning. So Rashit is just the, a form of Rosh, it means the beginning, right? So at the beginning, so <laughs> chief or first or head, uh, that's what the word Rosh means. So I would think to say that this is Rosh is referring to Russia would be a false etymology. That is, I don't think there's, a, you can take that Russia comes from the word head. Um, but the question is, why does it have the word Rosh here? And, and, and so I would say that the word Rosh is that there's something that's the head of Meshach and Tubal, so that there is a, a prince. And who would be the head of the multitude that are resurrected after the thousand years? Well, it's Satan, of course. So I me, think that uh, Rossiyah is the way they way they would say say, say Russian Russia in Russian Russia. So maybe yeah. it does come from. No, I I, I don't know. I, I can't remember the whole etymology of Russia, but look, remembering just roughly what I looked back years ago, that Russia would not come from the Hebrew Rosh, um, that there is another etymology for it that's much more likely because, you know, there's just, just how it is. I mean, so just because something sounds similar, and we know that Mishik and Tubal is related to Moscow and, 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 and Tubalski and all that stuff, right? So we can relate this to that area, but the fact that the word Rosh is just such a common word and, yeah. and that Satan is the one who's going, to, because it's, you know, this, this Rosh Prince and this word Nasi um, is, is like captain or chief. So, so, I mean, it, so this is just referring to the ruler or the one who's in charge of this, these military uh, powers or these nations that are being resurrected after the thousand years. So to me, it, it would be pretty clear that this has to be a reference to Satan. Um, yes, I, I, I totally agree. With that. Yeah. And, and that's why, because when we go to Revelation 20, verse 8 and 9, and we have these references, referenced, um, and it says in verse 7, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be loosed out of his prison and shall go to deceive the nations, which are on the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to the bat to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And when they went upon the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, and this is this is the events that occur before the great white throne judgment. So. Um, so this whole thing, obviously it goes right back to Ezekiel. I don't, I don't think that we, and, and I know you agree, but it's just something that's, that's very, very clear that we can take this story in this prophecy against Gog and in the stream of how we've looked at Ezekiel, you know, we've addressed, uh, the close of probation. We addressed, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, we addressed, um, uh, the resurrection of the righteous and the second coming, and now we're dealing with the period after the thousand years. So Ezekiel is giving us the same information that we find other places in the Bible, and he's just putting it all together for us. But again, we know that we've made an application 
of these things that places them earlier, that places them in our history as symbols, because Ezekiel himself is a symbol. And so all these things that are happening to him relate to our history. And in a sense, we've kind of reverse engineered this. That is, in this movement, we started applying things like the Valley of Dry Bones to 9-11, well, specifically to the period from 1989 to 9-11, and then uh, breathing upon you know, calling for the, the um, you know, breathe the breath to breathe upon the, the, those that had the, the line upon line, right? So that's 9-11, a call to the, to the winds, breathe, right? I can't remember the words. I'd have to look back the previous chapter, but you know what I'm talking about. We applied it to 9-11 and not realizing what we were doing. That is, we didn't realize that we were taking Ezekiel out of context and placing his prophecy of the resurrection at 9-11. And in so doing, we were, we were doing something that we weren't aware of that was actually demonstrating who this movement is. And so God gave us this information so that we could reverse engineer and understand who we were and what our purpose was. And when you look at all the events that have happened in this movement, um, in our repeat of Millerite history, once we get to July 18th, we should be able to clearly see that this is the key, that the final piece that places who we are, and yet this is being rejected by many. And, and when you do that, you're actually going to end up rejecting all of the, the pieces of information that God gave us that led us to that conclusion. So you're going to undo the message. And that, that's what's going to be happening and what has already happened with those that reject, rejected July 18th because they weren't willing to accept what July 18th was telling us, even though it's, it's telling us exactly what we always had been teaching. And that's the thing that's remarkable, about, remarkable for me is that people cannot see that what July 18th meant. Um, based upon, if you're in this movement and you know what this movement is about, you should be able to see what July 18th was about. Okay, so, so we have this, uh, the Son of Man is going to set his face against Gog. So this means he's going to give a prophecy against Gog at the land of Magog. So now Gog is a, a person here who is the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And so he's prophesying against Gog. So who is Gog then? Right, so Look at verse three. I say that I say and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshik and Tubal. So who is Gog? He's, a leader. he's what? He's a leader. Right. So he's Satan. So Gog right. is, is a name for Satan in this context. Because Gog is the head of Gog, Magog, right? And, and Meshik and Tubal. And he's in the land of Magog. So Magog becomes a symbol of this land. Um, and, and Meshik and Tubal, which these are all sons of Japheth, are all connected. But Gog is not mentioned uh, before this, right? So Gog is now um, this symbol. Now, when it comes to Gog... Um, now, there is some Israelite named Gog, but, um, and here it says also of some northern nation, um, when you look at the Strongs. But, but it's really clear here, it's not talking about a, a nation. It's the Gog, the land of Magog, the land of Gog. Gog is the leader and is in the land of Magog, and he's also leading Meshik and Tubal, which would be places or or nations within that land right so so gog is not a place but a person based upon these verse verses 
So when he's against the Ogog, the chief prince of Meshik and Tubal, it's obviously not referring to a nation being called Gog, but it's the land of Gog and Magog would be the land of Satan, right? So Satan's land, he's the one who's ruling that, or the nations. <clears throat> And, and then we have this prophecy against them. I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, and all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now, this idea of putting hooks in, in his jaws, where does this come from? What, what is this about? Now, this, I will turn thee back, is, is that Hebrew word shub, which um, is the one which means return. It's like, uh, um, you know, when they return to land, that's shub. Uh, uh, in, um, like, okay. in the Song of Solomon, shub, shub, it means return, return. Yeah, okay. Question there? Or okay. comment? Take a look at Stephen's comment in the chat. Okay. Um, the Pope's surname, surname is Bergoglio. Yeah, it has a gog in it. It's interesting. Okay, now on this on this particular verse, mm -hmm. part of what you and I were talking about earlier, about how this and chapter 39 or so so kind of linked together right one of the cross references that the the translators had used was ezekiel 39 2 mm -hmm. that goes into this especially with the hooks into thy jaws etc right now <clears throat> as i as i was preparing on this and looking at the alternate readings it is um, a little a little surprising because the verse itself reads, and I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring upon thee the mountains of Israel. Right. One of the alternate readings says, and I will turn thee back and I'm, I'm going going here to Ezekiel 38.4. Yeah. Compared with 39.2. Yeah. And I will turn thee back and draw thee back with a hook of six teeth. Okay. And, we'll yeah. draw and, and that's, of course, I leave but a sixth part is right. just one Hebrew word, shasha. But the other alternate reading on the, on this particular verse, which I know we're going to get to, is, yeah. and I will turn thee back and strike thee with six plagues. With six plagues? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and, and so, yeah. Okay, go ahead. keep going. Well, see, there's one of the things that, just going back to Stephen's comment, so after the thousand years, Satan is in control of the nations, right, to go against God's city. But do we have a parallel that happens in our history that we could look at that we've been applying already in this movement? I, I don't know if I asked that question well. Are you, are you talking about the Sunday law? Right, right. So we know that when we look at Daniel 11, um, you know, verse 40 to 45, uh, we have, uh, well, let's just go there. Um, so one of the things that we have when he says, he shall plant his tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, um, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So, and we know there's tidings out of the east and all these different things that happened before that. But how do we look at this? How would we depict this scene? Who is the he that shall plant his tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain? 
Well, the Pope. Right. So the Pope, right? That's who we look at. This is the papacy. So the papacy sits upon the throne of the earth. And it's, it's a very similar scene because the glorious holy mountain, this would be like the armies uh, encompassing Jerusalem um, after the thousand years. Right? It would be a, a similar situation. But after the thousand years, it's Satan himself who is gathering this army. But here we can see that the papacy is the one that's doing this. And it's it's going against God's people. Does that does that make sense to people? Yes, it does. Did you read what I put in chat there? Because I'm just making okay. a web of all these verses. Like Job 41, 1 and 2. Leviathan drawn out with a hook. Right. You know, like yeah. Stuff like that. I'm trying to connect it all. Yeah, so that's Job 41, verse 1 and 2. That's the one I was thinking of was Leviathan. Uh, this idea of a hook. Um, and to understand who Leviathan is, um, you know, a bit of study, but I, I think it's a symbol of Satan. Um, well, and, it could be the Pope too, because look at the Pope's hat. He has a fish hat like Dagon, the fish god. Well, well then that's the point is that, see, the point that I'm making is that when you take some of these prophecies, you can place them in, in, in the far distant future, like after the <coughs> thousand years. You know, especially Ezekiel, you can see it. It's going through this history in the stream of time, and we can see where it, where it is. But we know that there is an application to our time. And part of it that gives us this application to our time is the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45. Um, so, and we also have, um, you know, Revelation as well. So Revelation uh, uses a repeat and enlarge. And you can see that there can be applications of things that happen later that actually occur, that are connected with events that go before them. So, so the point that I was making yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, is that um, when it comes to type and anti-type, so we had talked about type and anti-type. And one of the things that we have failed to understand about types is that Without a type, you can't have the anti-type. That is, there are events that occur in history that are typical of the anti-type, the thing that happens in the end. But even types can be typical of types that are coming, right? So, you know, our line is a type, the, the, the line of the priests. Um, but so is the Millerite history a type of our line. But when we look at events that are going to happen, let's say something like the Sunday law or the close of probation, or we even used October 22nd, 1844, that without the types <coughs> that pointed to Millerite history, so without the three decrees at the beginning of the 2300 days, you couldn't have the three angels' messages at the end of the 2300 days. But also those three angels' messages at the end of the 2300 days are necessary in order to have to give October 22nd, 1844 any meaning. That is, if you just had a prophecy of the end of 2300 days, but you didn't have a movement that proclaimed that prophecy, nothing could have happened on October 22nd, 1844. Jesus couldn't really have gone from the holy to the most holy place without, because what's happening in heaven is connected with what's happening on earth. So there has to be something on earth that's connected. And, and so even for prophecy to be fulfilled, it requires all of these events that people are reacting to that allows, you know, for instance, the close of probation that happens when Michael stands up. Well, the reason he can stand up and say, let him that is righteous be righteous still. Let him that is filthy be filthy still. Is that a message has gone forth that has caused people to make those choices that he can now declare that some are righteous and they're not going to sin and they're going to be, be able to stand in the time of Jacob's trouble in, in the sight of the holy God without a mediator. And that you have another group of people that he can declare as wicked 
and no matter what kind of judgments come upon them, they are not going to turn from their wickedness. They're not going to repent. And, and this is the thing that is seen to be, I don't know if ignored is the right word. It's, it's almost like it just never came into our, our consciousness. We weren't really aware of what we were doing when we were talking about prophecy. And so in order for all the events to happen, Gog and Magog after the thousand years, you actually have to have the type that is occurring in our time so that we can even get to that point. Because Jesus can't come back until what? What has to happen before Jesus can return? His character has to be... Now, Christ's character has to be perfectly reproduced in his people. Yeah. And why does Christ's character have to be perfectly reproduced in his people? Go back to Genesis. What's that? Symbolically, that's the bride making herself ready. Right. But, but it even goes back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. Now, we know, of course, this is a reference to Christ. But it's also a reference to what happens at the end of the world. For Satan to finally be defeated, Christ needs this 144,000 saints to represent his character for, for once and for all to demonstrate that Satan's rebellion was unjustified, right? So the whole issues of the great controversy are demonstrated in God's people before God can close up history. So, so this, this, this idea is that as we pass over prophecies, these prophecies that, that are being fulfilled as we're, we're going through history, they reflect back upon to past events, right? So we, we then get an insight into past events. And these past events are types that shine ahead of us. They give light to our path ahead of us. And this principle is so important. It's one of the most important principles I've learned in understanding this movement and that this movement is what we are doing is we're enacting typically what's going to be happening. And, and that's because this movement, instead of just looking at what's happening, is we, we, we look at what's happening and we see that this relates to past events. And, and that those past events are what give us light. And, and so if we can't understand what July 18th is, if we can't understand that July 18th connects us to Samuel Snow's letters and connects us to Millerite history in such a specific way, then we're not going to have light for our feet ahead of us. And we're going to go off the path and go into darkness. You know, this is the warning that I've been giving about July 18th is that it's not just about, you know, were we right or were we wrong on July 18th. It's about our whole message. It's about Millerite history. It's about the time of Christ. It's about all these previous lines and everything that we have ever studied in this movement. Do we accept it as truth? And as soon as you say we were wrong, then we were wrong. You know, not just about July 18th, but we were wrong about everything else. Because July 18th didn't just pop out of nowhere. It was the result of this movement, understanding prophecy as we were passing through history. So, um, so getting back to um, Ezekiel then, and, and looking at um, this turning, I will turn thee back. So, you know, and again, that I will turn thee back. If you look at the Hebrew, it's, uh, I know not everybody here can read Hebrew, uh, but it's, it's just basically, it's, it's a compound word. It's got, and it's got a vav at the beginning, and then it says shu, bat, ti, and uh, so, ti, uh, not read, I don't know how, there's two b's together, so two bets, shu, bat, ti, so, um, so this just means I will uh, turn thee back, right? Um, but the point about this is um, 
and then it says here, uh, this word that, um, here, I'll go back here, I'll just show you. So here, I'll turn me back and put, this is the word Nathan, um, Nathan, it just means to give, right? And, and uh, as a gift. Um, and it's used in Daniel chapter 11 as well, uh, dealing with um, uh, the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination that make it desolate. Um, and then these hooks into thy jaws. Now we had this reference then, which was to Job. Um, so let's go there. I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, but we'll try to bring this together. Um, so it was Job 41, uh, verse 2, I believe. A canst thou put an hook into his nose or bore? So this is about Leviathan, verse 41. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? And um, and then we talked about this is a crocodile or a wreathed animal, a serpent, especially a crocodile or some other large sea monster. Figuratively, the constellation of the dragon, also the symbol of Babylon. But I think here in this context, it's not talking about Babylon. It's talking about Satan, though he's connected with Babylon. Um, so drawing out Leviathan with a hook. And, and this is what God is going to do in Ezekiel, is when he, he takes this, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth. And, um, you know, and this word, yatsa, I don't know if people are familiar with it, uh, but it's the same word that's used regarding uh, bringing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, right? <clears throat> And, and But then we're going to have here all thine army, horses, horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with buckler shields, and all of them handling swords. And, and then it says, Persia, which is uh, Parsa, uh, or Paras, Ethiopia, which is Cush. Um, so it's actually Ethiopia's northern Africa. And Cush, Cush and Mi Mitzrayim, or Egypt, usually go together. And then Libya, which is put. Um, so these are just the, the biblical names are Cush and Put, uh, but sometimes they translate it East Ethiopia, sometimes Libya, but you'll see these words uh, sometimes in the actual Hebrew. And all of them with shield and helmet. So why are they mentioning here Persia, uh, Cush, and Put? What are, what are these nations? What are these that, why would these be mentioned? Is that uh, military might and power? I mean, Ethiopia and Libya typically mean that. Yeah, so, um, so they got, and then they're gonna have Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the North Quarters and all the bands. Basically what they're doing is they're taking the nations all around Israel, right? So they're going to the areas in the south. Persia is in uh, the east. And Gomer is in the west. And uh, uh, Magog, Meshach, and Tubal are in the north. So, so this shows, and then that's why it says, um, like when it says out of the north quarters, right? So um, uh, Togarma is also out of the north, um, as well as Meshach and Tubal. So anyway, the point is they're surrounded, right? God's going to surround all these nations all around uh, Jerusalem, and he's going to gather them together. And, and they're military powers, as you said. So these are, are military powers. Um, be thou prepared and prepare thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now, so... Any, any comments on some of these verses? Um, so we can see that the sons of Ham are Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan, and uh, Cush, right? So that's also, so Cush and Put are um, Ethiopia and Libya. And, and also in Ezekiel 27.10, um, 
it had this, again, Persia was connected and Lud and Put were in thine army, thy men of war, they hang the shield and helmet in thee, they set forth thy comeliness. So in Ezekiel 27, uh, this was the lament for Tyre. And, and here they mention again, in the same context, Persia, um, Lud, which is different, right? But Put as well. And of course they mention these military aspect. So when it's dealing with all the different, uh, if you remember about Tyre, there was the, the, the merchandise, the merchanters, the mariners, but then here they dealt with Persia as a, a symbol of military might. Okay. So any, any comments on, on this? So, you know, uh, we have the right idea there dealing with Persia. It's a symbol of military might. Okay. Yeah, you're connecting it with the United States. Persia with the United States? I, ne I never thought of that, but uh, normally we teach, yeah, we connect Persia with the United States. So if you're uh, definitely, if you're applying to this to uh, our period of time, because, you know, because we're looking at this as symbols of the nations after the thousand years, but also we could say Persia is the United States because that's the military power of the papacy. And, and, and I think the way that I look at the first part, because uh, when we deal with um, Gog, right? So he's setting his face against Gog. We say that's Satan, but we secondarily apply it to the papacy in our time and the land of Magog. So he's the chief prince, that is his Gog, who's of the land of Magog. And he's the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So... If we're going to deal with Moscow, um, can we connect the papacy to what happened with Moscow? Which what happened? Yes, I was just read. I was just reading now that the, the the Russians are more or less starting to cuddle up to the Pope more and more. Right. And there were their great moves, right? Right. Eastern so, Orthodox. Yeah, so this can connect us with uh, the history of 1989 to the Sunday law, right? Uh, from what we already understand in this message. If we're going to take Russia here, Meshach and Tubal being Russia, not Rosh being Russia, but Meshach and Tubal being Russia. And we're going to have uh, Gog as being the Pope, but the land of Magog would be the Catholic world, right? And, and for a time... The Soviet Union was atheistic, but then the Pope joined with, with the United States, with Persia, and it, it overcame uh, atheism, right, and, and set up or opened up the door to Catholicism. Now, we know Russians are Russian Orthodox, but not all Russians are Russian Orthodox, or at least not all what was the Soviet Union. Uh, we know that many of them are Roman Catholics. And it's opened up the door to Roman Catholicism by just opening up the door to Catholicism in any of its forms, whether it's, uh, you know, Orthodox, Russian Orthodox or whatever. So, so we can look at this history as a prophecy from 1989 to the Sunday law. Does that, does that make sense in how we've understood these things? And then you have Ethiopia and Libya, which connects with Daniel 11. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Gomer, I think, would, would that represent uh, Greece? Well, yeah. So that's Greece. Gomer is Greece. Um, that's my understanding of Gomer. Maybe like the United Nations. Okay. Symbol. Yeah. So a symbol of the UN. Okay. Makes sense. Um, but, but the point is, even though we can look at this as something about it after the thousand years, but we can also apply this to our history and from what we already know. So this is telling us things we already know. Now it's a prophecy against God. So even though this is happening after Ezekiel 37, this is, in a sense, a repeat and enlarge of that whole history. 
because now it's just going to give us another symbol. So it's going to tell us about who Gog is, right? So that's what it's first doing. It's, it's describing the characteristics of the papacy. So it's using Gog as a symbol of the papacy at a specific time in history. That is from 1989 to the Sunday law in where the papacy is, is working behind the scenes to set itself upon the throne of the earth. So the papacy itself is going to be the one that rules when you have the threefold union. But it becomes a type of what happens after the thousand years with Satan and his armies gathering around the city of Jerusalem. Now, uh, I want to bring up a point that what many people do with Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 40 to 45, is um, they interpret it. Now, I'm not talking about Seventh-day Adventists. I'm talking about other Christians who, who um, and, and it wouldn't be evangelicals either. So this would be Christians who sort of take the Bible in, um, um, I, I don't know the word for it. It's, it's not preterism and it's not really uh, it, futurism. It's, it's just that they take the Bible as describing things uh, that it doesn't really understand. So it, it doesn't accept biblical inspiration. But one of the things they try to do is they try to say that what Daniel is doing is that he's just writing about the end of the world as he would understand it. And, and that he sees that end of the world coming in his time because he would have written this in like the second century BC because this wasn't really Daniel. Um, but, but the point is, People could look at this passage and just say that this is talking about, um, you know, literal armies against God's people of, of some sort of way that that is sort of prefigured into some sort of end time scenario. Uh, so this would be the critical scholars who look at Daniel in this way. Um, but one of the things that we see in understanding prophecy, so when we've studied the book of Daniel, especially Daniel chapter 11, is one as we know that Daniel wasn't written um, in the second century BC. It wasn't written, you know, in any connection with the Maccabean rebellion or, or anything like that. It doesn't really make any sense that you would interpret it that way. And plus, we also believe the Bible to be inspired, and we believe Revelation, and Daniel, and Ezekiel, and we can demonstrate that they are inspired. Uh, but the point is, this when you look at something like he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas. Now, um, and it says in the King James, in the glorious holy mountain, which is a mistranslation of the Hebrew. And I just want to uh, show people here. Um, uh, so and that's between the seas in um and it and it has the word here i don't know if you can see that uh but the the hebrew here is the word har which means mountain and it has a lamed bet before it and lamed is 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 a prefix and if you were going to have uh in the glorious holy holy mountain you would have a bet which is like a b but instead they have a, a lamed which is an l and um, L sound. And so it's lahar. And that means to or against uh, the glorious holy mountain. Um, so this is a point that is, is quite important in understanding this pa passage. So it says he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. Um, and uh, between the seas. And so who are the seas? The nations of the world. Yeah, they're the nations of the world. Now, of course, if you looked at it in a literal sense, you would say that this is the Mediterranean and, and, and so forth. Uh, but against or to the glorious holy mountain. So who is it that plants the tabernacles of his palace between the seas or the people against the glorious holy mountain? I mean, we know who it is. Right, so this would be the papacy. But if you were looking at the end of time, 
Is that what happens after the thousand years as well? Yes. Right. So, so we can see that what happens in Daniel 11, verse 45, which we have to place before the close of probation, because Daniel 12, verse 1 is Michael standing up at the close of probation, announcing this time of trouble. And, and so obviously they can't be referring to after the thousand years, right? So, so we know that. So we can see that this event, the Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, is going to give us the context where we can apply what we're studying here in Ezekiel uh, 38 and 39, and it's in Revelation 20, that we can take what's going to happen after the thousand years, and we can see that there's a similar scene symbolically being depicted here prior to the close of probation. This, this is an extremely important point because this is what this movement has been teaching, but not fully understanding of the arguments for it. Now, um, now let's, let's look at 38 verse 7. Uh, it says, be thou prepared and prepare for thyself thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. So who is he talking to here? God's people. Okay. So one of the things, well, so, so we have to decide that. So Hebrew is not always easy to figure out who's being spoken to. Now, when it says here at the beginning, son of man, set thy face against Gog and say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Gog. Right? So all through this, he's talking to Gog. Okay, so, so sometimes we can just read this here, and, and, um, and we can just think, okay, be thou prepared, prepared for thyself. Now, one of the things here is it's still in the singular. So it's saying thou, thyself, thou, thee, thou, etc. And so this, this thou is, is, is addressing a single individual. Okay, so options that we would have is either this is God talking to Ezekiel, saying, be thou prepared. Um, but of course, in the context here, it'd have to be God, because be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company. So what Ezekiel is saying, he's, he's talking to Gog, right? This is what God is saying that he has to say and prophesy to Gog. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company. So this would be all these armies that are assembled unto thee. So this could be a message to the Pope or it could be a message to Satan after the thousand years. And it says, and be thou guard unto them. And then it says, after many days, thou shalt be visited in the latter years Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people and against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. So, so this is saying that um, what is this saying? <laughs> so it's talking to Gog, right? So this thou is always this leader of these nations. And what's this? After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Yeah, I'm thinking this is after the 1,000 years. Right. So this is talking about after the 1,000 years, right? Um, now, uh, this word visited... Um, uh, has a lot of different meanings, but basically it means uh, he shall become an overseer or oversee these armies. So I don't think visited is the best way to translate this uh, because it says after many days, thou shalt be an overseer. In the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. So we know that there's going to be the destruction of the wicked before the thousand years. And what happens after the thousand years? Satan is going to be the leader 
of all these nations, that all these people that have been resurrected from the dead, the wicked, right? So he's going to gather all these many people against the mountains of Israel. So we know that that's going to be against uh, the city of Jerusalem, which have been always waste, right? But it is brought forth out of the nations. So who is the it that is brought forth out of the nations? And they shall dwell safely, all of them. So who is the ones that are going to dwell safely in spite of this army around them? Well, that's going to send the New Jerusalem. Right. Yeah. So it says, thou shalt ascend. Um, now, how would we apply this ascend? Where do we see this ascend in the Bible regarding what I, I will I will ascend to the sides of the north. I will be like the most high. Mm. Yeah. So this is Satan now finally getting to ascend. He finally gets to rule the world the way that he wants to. And shall come like a storm. And shall be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. Um, and it says, thus said the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought and thou shalt say i will go up to the land of unwalled villages i will go to them that are at rest that dwell safely all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take a spoil to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods so these are all the the nations so satan's going to take over the world Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof. Young lions refer to what? We've studied young lions. These are rulers, right? Nations that are, are like Babylon. And um, and and what does Ellen White say about what happens after the thousand years? What, when Satan comes up and the wicked come up, who else also comes up in that resurrection to go against the holy city? Which would be this reference to the young lions. Well, she talks about Napoleon and Nero. And right. So all these great military leaders are also going to be there and you know to come against jerusalem so these would be the young lions thereof shall say unto thee art thou come to take a spoil hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey to carry away silver and gold and take away cattle and goods and take a great spoil right so these people are, are with him they're saying are you going to do this you know because basically we're with you therefore son of man prophesy and say unto god so, so this is describing, up to verse 13, who Gog is. And we can see in the context here that this is Satan and that he's, after the thousand years, taking all of these nations, all of the people, all of the wicked, including all the great military leaders, um, and that they're going to go and take over the world, but their, their purpose is to gather an army to destroy God's people, but God's people shall be safe, right? So we don't need to worry about that. But also, how can we apply this? Who is Gog in our understanding of this? It's the papacy, right? And, right. and, and the papacy, is it going to gather all of the nations of the world and all of the young lions who would the young lions be in this context? Well, it would, would be churches as well as the civic leaders. Well, the young, young lions would refer to military powers, to, to nations. So I would think that it symbolizes the 10 kings, which are is the United Nations. I, I don't know if you can take young lions as referring to religious uh, powers but um and, and this is not dealing with religion here at all in this whole thing it's all about military might and 
And so that's, the Pope wants to sit on the throne of the earth. There's going to be a Sunday law, of course. But here in this context, it's referring to this, this military might that's going to be waged against God's people. So the thing we have to look forward yeah. to, what's that? <clears throat> But at the same time, I know a Catholic priest who became an Adventist. He was a marvelous SVA, but he got discouraged and left. He went to seminary and he was wondering why in seminary, the priests to be were all taught military training. He was an excellent sharpshooter and, and uh, archer. He soon found out why. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I, I remember when I went to uh, a Catholic boys camp. I'm not sure how I ended up there because I was the only Protestant at uh, the boys, the Catholic boys. It was St. Mary's um, uh, boys camp, you know, for two weeks. And it was, I mean, maybe this happens in all kinds of camps. I never went into any other camps. But one thing we did was uh, uh, shooting rifles and uh, shooting bows and arrows, you know, shooting arrows with a bow. Um so I don't know. Maybe that's a Catholic thing. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, um, you know, obviously the priests have some connection with um, because they're part of the militia of the Catholic Church. But but I think here, just in this context, this is really about military power um, that's going to be waged against God's people after the thousand years. But we're making an application of this uh, to the papacy. And what we see as that threefold union, the, the United Nations, the United States, and with the papacy, the eighth head, you know, receiving the healing of that deadly wound uh, to sit upon the throne of the earth. And so those events that happened before the thousand years are typical of the events that happen after the thousand years. So God always does this. You know, the thousand years, just like the 2300 days, has some prophecies at the beginning that are mirrored at the end. Same with things like the thousand years. Um, so that this becomes a type. Now, the next section is going to be a the prophecy against Gog. So in the first one, it's describing who Gog is and what Gog is going to do. So in the first part of this. And then in chapter 14, it's going to be this prophecy against Gog of how God is going to... Uh, conquer them and then when you get to 39 it's going to have two sections as well um and and they're sort of expanding upon it more um talking about the final destruction the fire that comes down from god out of heaven and then um, um and then this last section uh, the lord will restore israel uh, this is, is God finally restoring us after all these judgments against uh, Gog. So, um, so these are the promises that, you know, basically the new heaven and the new earth. So we finally inhabit the land of Israel that God intended us to, the heavenly Canaan. Um, but of course, we can see that we can apply this, all of these things, this destruction prior to the thousand years with the second coming. And, you know, and that's one of the things, you know, I find interesting. Um, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist and I would look at these things, I would see these similarities between the second coming and the destruction of the wicked. And then after the thousand years and the destruction of the wicked. And I used to always wonder, well, why does God do it that way? Now, of course, I came to understand that the wicked, when they're destroyed, I mean, God has already declared them as wicked, but yet the 144,000 have to go through the books and, and basically audit the books to show that God was correct in his judgment. And, and the question is, why do they have to do that? Why do you need this thousand years? If you, these people have already demonstrated God's character, the 144,000, but why do they have to go through those books for the thousand years? What is it that they're doing? Why is this meeting out of the judgment? Meeting out of the universe. Okay, so it's and it's not just the universe. Of course, the universe has been watching the earth, but all of the people who have died in the past 
um, who are righteous and all of the wicked, because we know that after the thousand years that we're going to have the great white throne judgment. And what's going to happen at the great white throne judgment? Who's being judged there? The wicked? Yeah, the wicked are going to be judged. at the. So, so we have the judgment in the sense of the righteous that's happening now, right? Since October 22nd, 1844, both the righteous dead and the righteous living. Um, and then you have, after the thousand years, the great white throne judgment. And there, uh, every person uh, basically gets to see their whole life and all of the decisions that they made. And so the 144,000 are going through these books. Um, they're showing this for their own benefit and also for the benefit of those that, that are righteous that have died and because those people need to be secure. So they need to see what has happened. But then also for the wicked themselves, they're going to then see both what they have done and they're going to see the sentence that was given to them and what is going to be their response. What's they're the going to say God's righteous? They're going to say God's righteous. Even Satan himself will bow the knee and say that God was righteous, that he was just. Now, imagine if you had a court system where uh, what the, what the, the jury had to do and what the judge had to do is convince the person who was the one charged with the crime that the sentence being pronounced against them is just. And that until it's until that person accepts it, that that sentence doesn't go into effect. Um, of course, you know, in the world today, it would be very difficult uh, to have that kind of court system. But that's the court system God has is that the wicked themselves have to agree with the sentence. And that sentence, of course, is death. And in, and in different people's cases, it's going to be much worse punishment. Um, so they'll suffer longer. But they all recognize that it is righteous, that God is righteous in his judgment. And, and I think this is pretty interesting. Now, of course, we have the great right, white throne judgment after the thousand years. Um, do we have something similar that happens before the thousand years for the wicked? Well, you have the, the resurrection, the special resurrection. <laughs> there you go. Right. So this special resurrection is, is typical of what's going to happen after the thousand years, because you have all of those people who were responsible for the death of Christ that were there, that witnessed it, all of the wicked that were involved in that. And, and then all of those that have lived under the proclamation of the third angel's message, who are also going to be resurrected. And they're going to uh, witness the second coming of Christ. And the wicked's response is, you know, they recognize that, that, they, they, that it's just, they recognize Christ for who he is. But after the thousand years, this is expanded so that they will actually bow the knee. So, so it's very interesting that we can take these events after the thousand years and we can find applications of, of types before the thousand years that parallel what happens after the thousand years. So thanks everyone for the study. I hope it was... Uh, enlightening. Um, there's lots I've learned in studying uh, Ezekiel, and I don't think I would have ever been able to see Ezekiel 38 and 39 the way that I have without this study. Um, it, it's just quite amazing. Um, and there's still going to be more that we're going to gather from, from this. Any final comments? Yeah, and the great white throne judgment comes in, in Revelation, um, uh, if you if you just go, uh, whoops, Revelation. You have the thousand years, the defeat of Satan, and then the judgment before the great white throne. So Ezekiel is giving us the same history. Um, 
that we see here in Revelation 20. But uh, Angela's also referred us to um, PH, is that Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11, Revelation 3, verse 7 to 13. Uh, so let's, let's just take a look at those. Um, so Philippians 2, verse... Uh, okay, so this is dealing with uh, Christ, that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And, and it's in verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. So, so showing that Christ in taking upon humanity and is found in fashion as a man and humbles himself and becomes obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is why he's exalted to the point that everybody acknowledges uh, he, who he is. And uh, the other one she gives here is Revelation 3, um, verse 7, uh, which is going to deal with Philadelphia. And so this is the open and the shut door, which we looked at before. And it says in verse 9, um, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and know that I have loved thee. So this is talking about the wicked uh, bowing before the feet. Now, if we look at the church of Philadelphia, um, did the, in, in the history of the church of Philadelphia, dealing with the open and the shut door, did the wicked come and bow at the feet of the saints? Did that, did that part get fulfilled in the church of Philadelphia? No. In that time. Not really, right? But right. what it's saying is that the Church of Philadelphia, those who were connected with that history that were mocked by the synagogue of Satan, um, and Ellen White refers to the synagogue of Satan as those that basically mocked uh, and rejected the message of, of uh, the midnight cry, um, that they will come and bow before our feet. So those who were actually even in the Church of Philadelphia, so we just kind of think under the third angel's message. But I think also those that were involved in the Millerite movement will also be resurrected in the special resurrection and experience that. Um, you know, how, we can, what's that? We can maybe see, can maybe see uh, Joseph with his brothers being a type of that event as well. Yes. Yeah. Joseph with his brothers. So and that's one of the things we, we've already done is we've connected the story of Joseph. So, um, so there, there's just, there's so many connections in the Bible that definitely cannot be accidental. You know, we can see that God has, uh, he's put together the Bible in such a way that no man could have ever conceived of such a thing, especially since it's written over such a long period of time. And so much of it has been not understood uh, to see all these things coming together at this time is, is to me the most powerful testimony of the truthfulness of this movement. And, and again, uh, not to harp upon this, but when you look at all the light that came to this movement, especially, you know, in the last seven or eight years, to me, it's remarkable that somebody can say, well, we were wrong. Because in doing that, it just shows that they didn't understand the message at all. Um, because the light that's come to us is an, is an unfolding of everything that had been given to us before. And if you reject that light, Ellen White says that you didn't understand the old light. And, and this just doesn't go back to, in this movement, it goes back to Millerite history, it goes back to the time of Christ, basically goes to all of history of all the light that God has given. And, and we should be able to see that what God has done in this movement is an unfolding of light. And, it, and it's just remarkable that all these things come together. So thanks, everybody, for all those comments. Um, 
Yeah, and Revelation 20, verse 8 does specifically refer to Gog and Magog. So um, let's uh, close with prayer. Just do this here. Dear Father in heaven, we are, are thankful for the time that we have here have had here this morning uh, to study together. We're thankful for the way that you teach us. Again, we uphold each um, person in prayer. We know that there are some difficult times ahead. And some of us are experiencing uh, trials right now uh, that uh, we need your help and your intervention. Again, we know that these things are for our good and that blessings always come. Uh, from the way that you allow trials to come upon us. So help us to see uh, the silver lining in the clouds that are around us. Help us to trust in you and to have a peace and a confidence uh, that you are in control, that you know all things, and that you have better things planned for us than the things we see right now. We know, Lord, of course, there's great trials, so we, we ask for uh, that you can help us each day to prepare, uh, to use our time wisely. And uh, also we ask that you can provide for our needs upon this earth and for the needs of this movement in giving a message, not just to, to the world, but also to the people in the movement who are scattered. We ask, Lord, that you can use us to reach out to them. I pray for my paper on the uh, uh, the questions regarding July 18, I pray that you can bless that paper and that uh, it can get into the hands of those who need it most. Thank you for hearing the, our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.